a second meeting of the Long Beach City Commission meeting for February to order. It's February 21st, 2023 at 7 p.m. and we are in Commission Chambers. I hope you felt welcomed this evening uh, by our Public Works Director, Sean Finley, and then our Deputy Fire Chief, Nate Cordier, served as greeters this evening. Uh, I want to introduce the folks who are sitting up in front of you. To my right, your left, is Recording Secretary Taylor Lockhart. Next, our City Clerk, Susan Dottis. Commissioner from Zone 1, Larry Tolland. Hi, guys. Commissioner from Zone 2, Travis Sargent. Good evening, everybody. To my left and your right, our Commissioner from Zone 3, Susan Persis. Good evening and welcome, everyone. Our Deputy Mayor and Zone 4 Commissioner, Harold Briley. Good evening, everyone. City Manager, Joyce Shanahan. <laughs> Assistant City Manager, Claire Whitley. City Attorney, Randy Hayes. And for those of you listening online, I'm Mayor Bill Partington. Uh, at this time, if you would please silence your cell phones and uh, we will rise for the invocation given by Pastor Steve Paris from Rima Ridge Baptist Church and that will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would bow with me. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the beautiful day that you gave us to enjoy here in Ormond Beach. We want to thank you for the gift of life and breath that you give to each one of us. We ask that you help us each to number our days, that we might use them wisely. We thank you for the hope of eternal life that we can have through faith in Jesus Christ. I lift up our mayor, our commissioner's father, as they consider the business of our city. I ask that you would help them to consider how their decisions impact the lives of those in our community that you would consider the least of these. Strengthen them with wisdom and grace as they perform their duties. Give them a servant's heart. Give them patience and endurance. Help them to manage the affairs of our city with dignity and respect for one another, especially for those who may not agree with their positions or decisions. Keep their hearts pure and their eyes turned toward you as they serve the people of Ormond Beach. And I pray all this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Pastor Paris, as you're walking out, I just want to thank you. Uh, not only for tonight, but you did an amazing job for our former photographer, uh, his memorial service, Dave Pizzo. He's very special to us and uh, just an incredible remembrance of him and everybody that was there. It was a sad occasion, but uh, it, you guys did a wonderful job with it. So thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. All right, and we're going to start with presentations tonight. We have the 21-22 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report. Uh, Kelly McGuire is our Finance Director, and we're going to start with Zach Shalafor from James Moore. All right. Good there we go. Good evening, Zach Shalafor, partner of James Moore & Company. Uh, I am joined this evening by Harry Sear, the manager on the city's audit. Uh, so we are here to review the audit for the September 30th, 2022 fiscal year. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the commission, as always, for the opportunity. And I will note also that we did all meet uh, individually to really take a deep dive through all of this. Uh, I told the mayor I'd be glad to do the 60 to 90 minute version of this presentation uh, in this meeting, but I, I didn't get it the what I was hoping for. So we're going to try to keep it very brief uh, this evening and really hit the highlights to summarize the results uh, of the audit. And let's see, it's a song. There we go. All right, so in these, this document, which is about 200 pages, known as an annual comprehensive financial report, uh, these are management's financial statements. Uh, and there's five reports that we issue that really summarize the results of the audit. Uh, the first report is the audit report 
uh, on the financial statements themselves. We did issue what's called an unmodified report, which states that your financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects. Uh, this is the best opinion that we can issue and effectively says uh, that the numbers herein can be relied upon. So it's what you want to see in this report. Uh, the second report, uh, we did perform a federal single audit or kind of a mini compliance audit over your major federal grant programs. Uh, we had no issues to report with regard to the compliance of those and did note that we believe the city to be in compliance, so a clean report on that front. Uh, we also performed the audit in accordance with government auditing standards where as it relates to financial reporting, if we had any internal control deficiencies that came to our attention, we would have to report those here. We had no such comments uh, to report. Uh, the fourth report is kind of a catch-all of requirements from the state of Florida Auditor General's Office uh, that they require us to report back on. One of those is any other comments, recommendations. Uh, I have a couple, I have just one item there of note related to kind of the, the year-end monitoring of the budget for your kind of non-major funds that you're not really operating from, uh, but looking at that process there. So nothing of concern, but the, the one note that we did have to uh, identify this year, which we expect will be covered uh, and corrected next year. Uh, the final report, we have to look at the city's compliance with state statutes over investment activity and investment policy and did note the city to be in compliance uh, with that statute. And finally, we do issue separate audit reports for each of the city's CRAs. Uh, had a clean slate of reports on those uh, two and also noted that based on our testing, all of the expenditures from the CRAs uh, were made in accordance with the CRA plans and applicable state statutes. A uh, quick look at your general fund. Uh, your, your fund balance here is kind of your reserves as we look at it. Uh, it's broken into different buckets. Uh, the non-spendable and restricted are monies that either you don't have available to spend or those are externally uh, restricted. So those get backed out when we look at the $13.6 uh, million in here. Uh, the bulk of those reserves trickle down into your assigned and your unassigned buckets where the assigned represents effectively earmarked buckets uh, that totaled almost three million dollars and then your unassigned of about almost uh, nine million is made up of first your <laughs> revenue stabilization fund where i know you're talking about a couple uses there related to the solid waste contract and hurricane uh, and then about a six million dollar residual or kind of general reserve as we're calling it here uh, you were in compliance with your internal policy of the minimum of 15 percent looking at just your unassigned and then you're also uh, in compliance Compliance and over any kind of uh, industry benchmarks with regard to what that reserve should be in addition to your internal policy. So no uh, concerns there. The city continues to be in a, in a strong financial position. Uh, and lastly, every year I talk about pensions. Uh, we always kind of know, I like to say, you're never as good as you look, you're never as bad as you look. It's always about making the right decisions uh, for the long haul. So when we went through this last year, uh, that unfunded pension liability dropped to $6 million based on a crazy good uh, investment market year. Uh, 2022 kind of went the other way, so that those liabilities kind of shifted back. Uh, but as we talked about individually, I mean, the, uh, there have been kind of good long-term thinking decisions made with regard to those plans, and it's kind of just riding the wave from there. Uh, every year, uh, you contribute funds based on what the actuaries uh, determine for those plans, and it really is about that long-term process versus, again, you're never as good as you look in a good year, you're never as bad as you look in a bad year. It, it kind of will level off, uh, generally speaking, over time. But that number does show up in your financial statements in terms of that 30 six million dollar cumulative number so i always do like to touch on that because it's not a hey you're going to go write a check for that it's really the the ongoing commitment is every year making those contributions uh based on those valuations and having a good process in place which you have historically uh had with regard to the funding of those plans uh, so that covers the the quick version of the highlights we'd be more than glad to answer any questions and thank you all again for the chance to be here any questions for zach Zach, great report, great work as always. Uh, <clears throat> and I know you met with everybody on the commission. I know you'll meet with anybody really and go over go over these numbers if they ask you to, which I pr I've always appreciated. And uh, we thank you for that. A couple of things I just wanted to point out. And a modified opinion is the best opinion you can get. That's what you want. Yes, unmodified. Unmodified, okay. and that's what we got. Uh, no findings on the single audit report. 
As far as internal control and compliance reports, no material weaknesses or compliance matters. And then uh, the independent accountant's exam report, cities in compliance with specified investment policy statutes. And so thank you for confirming that. We pretty much already knew that because Kelly and Dan win the uh, government accounting awards every single year. They do an amazing job, supervised with Joyce and uh, all our staff. But it's just we're lucky to be in a good position from a budget perspective. Uh, <clears throat> as far as our general fund reserve, I'd like to see it a little higher. You know, it's something that this commission can maybe work towards. We haven't violated our policy of going below 15%. I don't think ever, honestly, since we set that, which is fantastic. I noticed our sister county to the north uh, just recently had a very important purchase that they had to make, and it dropped them to below 5% of their uh, general fund reserve. And there were a lot of concerns and and uh, gnashing of teeth about that. But um, it's something that you have to understand that we live in a coastal community. At some point, you may need those reserves. And so protecting them is vital. One thing we talked about yesterday, Zach, uh, with this budget is that there's not a lot of fluff. Uh, it's a very lean budget from year to year to year. There's not uh, really a lot of carryover. That's how our residents like it. As a commission, having good fiscal management, we beat our chest about that, both at election time and any other time, I guess. We're proud of that. Um, but I just wanted to, to point that out. You work for a lot of different communities, and so uh, I know when you tell me that, that we can take it to heart and, and know that it's the truth. Uh, James Moore has been well respected and done a, done a good job for us. The only other comment I had uh, was on the pension funds. You know, we were feeling really good last year. And all it takes is a, a year, and boom, you're down uh, from an 89.8% funding level to 72.5. Um, Kelly works hard on the actuarial numbers, trying to keep us uh, as funded as possible, but life happens and the stock market happens. And so uh, trying to be conservative, we always say we want to be <laughs> equitable with our employees, but we also want to be sustainable. And so uh, we're careful with those numbers to try and make sure we don't go uh, very low on our funding ratios. And so I think, you know, 72.5 is starting to make me a little nervous. Fire 75.2. They were at 93.6 last year. And then the generals were over 100% funded, and now they're down to 80.9%. So that just takes one bad year of uh, results in the stock market, and you can end up in a difficult position. So uh, you can't get too confident in always in continued success, especially when you're dealing with the stock market. What do they say? Past performance is not an indication of future successes, unfortunately. Uh, we wish it were in every case. But that's all my comments, Commission. I don't know if staff or anyone else had anything to add, but Commissioner Persons. I agree about the, you know, being close to the 15%. That makes me a little bit nervous. I wish we could go up because I know so many coastal cities have a whole lot more than we do. So I do think that's something we should look at. Mr. Mayor, I agree with your comments on the on the pensions. Um, unfortunately, that's, I'm sure we're not the only municipality or the only jurisdiction that's facing that, you know, this year. So other than that, I think great job. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. And Joyce, did you have anything to add? Um, just that um, staff is requesting that you um, accept this report. Right. Is there a motion to accept? So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, please call the vote. Yes. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Byron? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. And thank you very much, Zach. Thanks, y'all. Yep. Audience remarks, I have two cards, uh, and we'll start with Dr. Lentz. Yeah, I had so many times over Rick or Dr. Ricky, but <laughs> I, I really appreciate 
being here in Mormon. Uh, my great grandfather was one of the founders of Daytona, came with Matthias Day, so I got a lot of history in the area. And I've moved to Ormond about five years ago, built a new house, and just love it. And I'm so pleased to be part of this community. But I have a, a, a real problem living on John Anderson, which is probably one of the prettiest streets that's ever been created in any town anywhere. And it's a big part of the loop. And so there's a lot of traffic on it. And people go, I know it's 25 miles an hour, but they go 65 miles an hour. And if you go down the street and look, you'll see all these sticks, remembrances of people that have died on that street. And there are way too many. And so it, it flies in the face of reason to not have a sidewalk on that street. I know you all have been here before, not you personally, but the commission. And I, I, I live there and watch it every day. Mothers pushing their buggies with their babies through the grass. God, so much better than pushing it down the street. Uh, children riding their bikes down there. And, and it's also a big bike pathway because people do the loop. And it's, it's just... And it's not about me because I have a sidewalk in one small area of John Anderson is across the street from me. I get on my bike, get on the sidewalk, go up Amston, and I have no problem. But you, you can't be a physician and see this worrisome situation where kids, mothers, babies, and old people that are trying to walk down the street just to get some exercise are at jeopardy. And I've talked to, I think, every one of you, and lobbied you, and you have been kind enough to listen. But I just pray that you all can come together and, and make a plan to put a sidewalk down John Anderson. I go out to Williamson, and there's this giant sidewalk, beautiful but there's hardly anybody on there. Uh, and I understand that's a new development and that's what you do when you do a new development. And that street must go back to 1913 when Oceanside Country Club was created. So I understand why it's not there, but I don't understand why we don't address it now and try to prevent some catastrophic event. And I appreciate the police department because they have been trying to patrol it to keep those people from going 65 miles an hour. Thank you, and Doctor. We'll see at the end of the meeting, maybe somebody will bring that up as something we can readdress. All right, that's my room. I'm done. That's it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you all for listening. It's just so nice to have a commission that's so uh, responsible. Thank you. Yep. Reverend Floyd Narcisse. Good evening. My name is Reverend Floyd Lindsay Narcisse. I am the pastor of Historic New Bethel Amy Church here in Ormond Beach, Florida. I moved here two years ago. And first, when I moved here, I came to the mission meeting here, committed to a police department because I believe that we have one of the best police departments in the state of Florida because our chief is a good man and he does a great job. Um, I try to do the right thing in our community. When I first got here, I, I stepped up and I fight for what's right. And now I want to apologize to the commission because I came here during the January 6th and blamed you all for having people from the city in that January 6th. I want to apologize publicly for doing that. But now, it's Black History Month. And I believe that Black History, not just on February, but it should be every 12 months of the year. But my church is going to have a black history program because we have a wonderful government to decide that we should not do it in the schools, which is okay, because I'm conservative, so it's all right. So I'm inviting the commission and everyone who's here to come to 115 South Long Street, on the Beach, Florida, to celebrate with me black history. It's not just because I'm black, 
because black history is American history. I thank you all for your service. I thank you all for all that you, what you do. You take time out your busy schedule, away from your families, to serve this community. And I thank you for serving this community. I want to serve this community with you. I don't want to have no more problems. Right? Black. Let's come together in love and unity. I made mistakes. We all gonna make mistakes. But thank God, God forgives us. Because we see another day. So my brothers and my sisters, my council people, the new ones, welcome. Sergeant, my, my, my zone, welcome. <laughs> to all of you who probably don't know me, I'm going to be around again. I'm going to make some mistakes. And I ask that you forgive me as we work together, because we all going to make mistakes. But I'm here publicly to say I made a mistake. And when we make a mistake, we come to the people and say, you know what, we made a mistake. My people, I made a mistake. But guess what? I'm still going to be here and try to continue to do what's right. I love you all, so please come support, let's love, and have a great, wonderful night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. What, what date? We can, he didn't give us a date. Oh, time. date and time. Date and time of your event, please. This Sunday at 10 a.m. And we will be serving food, so serve food after service. <laughs> May I um, pass this out to the council, the flyer? Of course. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you. Next up is approval of minutes. These are the uh, minutes from the February 7th, 2023 Barnum Beach City Commission meeting. They've been sent to the commission for review, posted to the city's website. Any additions, deletions, or corrections, commission? Move approval of the, of the minutes for February 7th, 2023. Second. Moved and seconded. Please call the vote. Or you want me to do a voice vote? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, like sign, and we'll show those passing unanimously. The consent agenda, uh, does anyone wish to pull any items from the consent agenda? Mr. Mayor, I move approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Please call the vote. Commissioner Sargent. Yes. Commissioner Persis. Yes. Commissioner Briley. Yes. Commissioner Tolland. Yes. Mayor Partington. Yes. Any Commissioner, wish to comment on any of the consent agenda items? If not, we will start quiet group. the public hearings, and I will open the public hearings, ask our clerk to read 8A. Ordinance number 2023-13, an ordinance amending paragraph C, official zoning map of section 2-01, established of article 1, establishment of zoning districts and official zoning map of chapter 2, district and general regulations of the city of Orange Beach Lane Development Code by amending the official zoning map to rezone two parcels of real property totaling approximately 13.13 acres generally located south of the platted road of Pennsylvania Avenue and along the platted road Roadways of Rosemary Street and Benton Street, west of Plantation Oaks Boulevard, Volusia County Parcel Appraiser Parcel Identification Numbers 3136-01-08-0010 and 3136-01-09-0001 from B-7 Highway Tourist Commercial to R-4 Single Family Cluster and Townhouse, authorizing provision of official signing map, repealing all inconsistent ordinances or parts thereof, and setting forth an effective date. This is the second reading of ordinance number 2023-13, read by title only. Thank you. And uh, at this point, I don't have any cards. I believe the applicant uh, or their representative is here. If we need any further questions, it is a second reading. Commission, is there a motion? No. I'll, I'll move that we accept 2023-13. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Please call the vote. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Briley? Yes. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. 
Commissioner Sergeant? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. 8B. Ordinance number 2023-15, an ordinance amending paragraph C, official zoning map of section 2-01, establish of article 1, establishment of zoning districts and official zoning map of chapter 2, district and general regulations of the City of Ormond Beach Land Development Code, by amending the official zoning map to rezone one parcel of real property totaling 0 0.30 plus or minus acres, located at 101 Fiesta Drive, Volusia County parcel number 4220-01-00-0450 from R-3 single family medium density to B-1 professional office hospital authorizing revision of official zoning map repealing all inconsistent ordinances or parts thereof and setting forth an effective date. This is the first reading of ordinance number 2023-15 read by title only. Thank you, Susan. And I'll ask our planning director, Stephen Spraker, to brief us on this item. Good evening, Stephen Spraker, planning director. At the last meeting, there was a land use amendment for this property. Um, the restrictions regarding the flood ratio and the density are with the land use. This doesn't change that item. So for every property, there's a land use and a zoning. This is the zoning aspect. It has to be consistent with the land use. Uh, we are recommending going um, to um, the B1 Office Professional Land Use. Um, it was reviewed by the Planning Board. We recommend approval 5 to 0. The applicant is here to address the Commissioner if there are any questions. Thank you, Stephen. Any questions for the Applicant Commission? Yeah. Mr. Mayor, only just uh, one comment. Um, I did receive a few phone calls on this, and I've talked to uh, one resident who was here earlier this evening who has left, and uh, the other said, if there's anyone is listening online, this is just the us. Uh, this is basically an application of the appropriate zoning for the land use we passed before. So this doesn't change the project at all. It's still a parking lot, but I think there was some confusion that some folks got letters. They thought you know, there was trying to be changed to something else. So I just want everyone to know that it's still being proposed as a parking lot and nothing else. Thank you for that clarification. And uh, is there a motion? I move approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion, Commission? I know we went over this fairly thoroughly last time. Um, if there's no discussion or comments, I'll ask. I, I, I'd like to make a comment. Since I wasn't here last week, uh, I mean last meeting, uh, I did listen to the meeting um, that was recorded, and I'm very appreciative of all the changes that the developer was making, you know, with the residents' input, and, and I think um, he hit everything, at least it looked like he hit everything that the um, residents were concerned about, so I'm appreciative, appreciative of that. <coughs> Sorry. No problem. Please call the vote. Commissioner Biley? Yes. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. 8C. Resolution number 2023-55, a resolution authorizing the execution and issuance of a development order for a special exception to allow outdoor activity to include itinerant vending and live outdoor music during recognized special events and live outdoor music on Saturdays and Sundays at Boot Hill Saloon Outpost located at 1089 North U.S. Highway 1 within the B-7 Five, service commercial zoning district, establishing conditions and setting forth an effective date. This is resolution number 2023-55, read by title only. Thank you, Susan, and I'll ask our planning director again to speak on this item. Good evening, Steven Spraker. The property is located at 1089 North U.S. Highway 1. So this is the Highway U.S. 1 right here. The airport road is located here. Uh, the property has an existing special exception that was approved for a three-year period. Um, they're part of the interlocal service boundary agreement. Some properties came in under the Volusia County uh, zoning. They were allowed to do special events under certain conditions. Um, this one didn't have a, a, a full established permanent use. They had a fire at the restaurant. So they went through the special exception process. Um, they've been at it for three years. There's been no code enforcement action. 
So what they're seeking to do is to uh, continue on with two aspects. One is itinerant vending during special events and then live outdoor music during those special events. And then the second aspect is live outdoor music, Saturdays and Sundays from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. with a maximum of two live performers. Within the development order, there is a code enforcement provision. So if you violate it twice per, uh, in a calendar year, you lose that. So there is a mechanism for enforcement. Um, it was reviewed by our planning board. We recommend approval 7 to 0. And the applicant is here if there are any questions. All right. I have one card from Karen Garris. Who is the applicant? Anyone have questions for the applicant? I have one for Stephen. Okay. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> so is this consistent with the, the type of um, pass that we had for the um, Iron Horse as well with with their live music? So the I'm, when, I'm trying to remember we've had people come in front of us asking for the live music when I was on the planning board. Is this consistent with what we've done in the past? Uh, very consistent. So some, some properties such as Iron Horse were existing in the county. And as the city enacted the Interlocal Service Bank Agreement, the, the uh, decision was if you had a, a permanent year-round business and you had itinerant vending, you were able to keep it. So the Iron Horse, Destination Daytona. But we have had other properties, um, the 906 North US Highway 1, there was a bar there that had, that had uh, special events. Um, the old Dairy Queen site had special events. So this is really the first one who's come back after three years. The other properties have sold, you know, done whatever, um, and they're, you know, if you go buy the property, they have made a substantial investment into it. They've done landscaping, and, and I think they have future plans with the rest of the property. So okay. they've been good stewards of the special exception. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions, either for Stephen or the applicant? Just need a motion and a second. I move approval. I'll second that. We've been seconded. Any discussion? Please call the vote. Commissioner Tolland? Yes. Commissioner Sargent? Yes. Commissioner Persis? Yes. Commissioner Byron? Yes. Mayor Partington? Yes. And we'll close the public hearings. 9A, impact fee update, including police and fire impact fees. I'll ask uh, first planning director, Stephen Spraker, to speak on this item, and then I have one card. Good evening, good evening Stephen Spraker, planning director. Um, Sean, Raftala, Sean uh, Cassio with Raftalis will come up and do the presentation. Um, what we're trying to do is, one, summarize what happened in September. Um, the, the new commissioner, so we want to make sure that we get your policy input on what happened at that meeting. And then we want to show you what uh, the police and fire impact fee study uh, came up with. And then there are six policy directions that we're seeking from the commission to help us come back to you with an ordinance. Um, the presentation is going to be a high level, so we're going to kind of skip over some things. Because, And if there's any questions that you have for that, please ask it. Uh, we're just trying to hear to to, to inform you with that. I'll uh, allow Mr. Arcaxio to come up and Good evening. Uh, my name is Sean Ocasio. Good evening. Uh, sorry. I've often been accused that I speak too softly, so please feel free to let me know and chime in, you know, do something like that if you like. Good deal. Um, I'm a manager with Raftalis Financial Consultants. I can't hear. You're going to have to speak. Sounds good. Perfect. How's that? Perfect. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, so I'm the project manager on this engagement with the city. I've been working alongside Tony Harrison. Uh, he's been the project director on this engagement. Uh, he wasn't able to attend this evening, so I'm, I'm here in his stead. Um, but I've been uh, essentially working with the city uh, throughout this entire process with respect to the utility connection fees and the municipal impact fees and the feasibility analysis for police and fire, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So uh, just a couple of items, like Stephen mentioned, I'll try to go through this fairly expeditiously just to make sure um, that there is some recap, but feel free to please interrupt me at any time with any questions, um, if you want me to elaborate on something, uh, and I can pause and we can go from there. 
um, in terms of the, the overall plan for the, uh, the presentation, I wanted to give a little bit of background on the study itself, uh, then from there go into a little bit of just a high-level background on connection fees versus municipal impact fees, and um, then uh, recap the prior presentations on major decision points and, and results, and then go into the actual uh, police and fire analysis that we completed and uh, go over those pr proposed fees. Um, so, you know, we've, we've been in this process uh, with the city since uh, June of uh, 2021. Uh, as a part of that initial scope, what we've done is looked at your water and sewer utility connection fees, uh, your um, uh, parks and recreation impact fees, your stormwater impact fees, as well as uh, transportation uh, fees, so that would be the local roads impact fees and mobility fees, and then also a uh, feasibility analysis uh, with respect to police and fire. Um, and those, uh, those recommendations were actually presented, I want to say, back in September. Uh, that was uh, Tony Harrison's presentation, where we got some guidance uh, to move ahead on the police and fire side, and then actually develop those proposed fee calculations. So um, you know, utility connection fees, uh, these are fees that are paid on the front end of uh, new development or redevelopment. Uh, they're essentially, they're, their purpose is to assign growth-related costs uh, to growth, so that growth pays for it for a share of uh, capacity in the systems. Um, it helps uh, avoid passing some of the burden to existing ratepayers by making sure new growth pays for its its uh, incremental capacity. Um, on the municipal impact fee side, they are similar in nature in so much as they're paid on the front end. Um, you know, when a new home is, is uh, constructed or, or redeveloped, uh, properties redeveloped, um, with the, the main difference being uh, that uh, impact fees themselves actually have certain uh, legal requirements to them uh, based on the Florida statutes. There's the Florida Impact Fee Act that's been uh, amended a number of times over the years, most recently back in 2021, where they... Um, where they um, put some additional requirements uh, into the statute for the purposes of developing and applying the fees. Um, as you can see uh, on screen here, uh, there's a number of uh, requirements that are that are uh, encompassed in that legislation. Um, anything from you know, that the fees have to be based on most recent localized data, and that's partially why we're doing the study, is to make sure that the, the current fees are reflective of the current investment that's uh, in the various departments and, and infrastructure and everything. Um, there's also the, the newest additions is probably the last bullet down there. Um, it has to do with respect to fee phasing, um, that you know there's uh, certain caps and certain provisions if you want to exceed the cap, and we can talk about that later if you like. Um, I'll skim through uh, this one here. Essentially, just speaks to more some of the, the, the requirements that uh, the fees have to be based on uh, cost of capacity to serve new growth, and then have to be spent to provide those uh, services to new growth. Um, they have to be based on reasonable levels of service. Um, and you can't use them to create a windfall uh, to existing users, so they have to just be paying for uh, growth-related costs. So uh, jumping straight right into uh, the water and sewer connection fees, uh, what you'll see on the screen here is what was presented previously. Uh, we have um, proposed fees for uh, single-family, multifamily, and mobile home uh, for water and irrigation versus wastewater. And what you'll see here is um, we have uh, uh, usage factors or ELU factors, equivalent living unit uh, factor, uh, existing fees, proposed fees, and the uh, respective changes. Um, one thing I, I would like to note on, on this particular slide that I think came up as a discussion point in the prior presentation is with respect to the derivation of those ELU factors um, between the, the differences between single-family, uh, multi-family, and, and um, uh, mobile home. Uh, the way those factors are derived is we actually look at your, your summary billing statistics, so your actual uh, bills and, and uh, metered flows for a uh, given historical period of time. And we carve that up into looking at those classes um, individually, single-family, multi-family, and mobile home. And then we look at the relative um, average use per um, living unit. Um, and then scale those factors accordingly. So um, if, if you think of everything in terms of single family unit as being one, then what that um, essentially is representing is that the multifamily on average has a, a usage of about 80% of what a normal home would have. And a mobile home would have about 90% uh, or so. And so that's how those factors came into be. So um, you know, when it, when it uh, relates to uh, the, the prior decision points and, and recommendations, um, you know, uh, it was our recommendation that the proposed fees that were in the prior slide would uh, be considered for adoption. Um, we do think that these fees should be reviewed periodically because we want to make sure that you know, reflect the most recent investments in your system, any changes in growth, you know, any change in uh, future uh, capital planning. Sometimes there's uh, EPA requirements that change certain you know, cost items uh, on the infrastructure side, so you want to make sure you try to do this um, you know, over time every 
you know, three to five years or so, just depending on your unique situation. Um, one of the other major recommendations is actually with respect to uh, the application of the fees. Um, we think that there should be a, a delineation or a distinction um, the existing service area versus the western service area, and that currently that the fees should be applied uniformly across those two uh, districts or, or zones until such time as the, um, the uh, specific capital requirements for the, the western service area are a little more fleshed out, and then at that point uh, an update could be conducted to develop a fee specifically for that zone, but at least at this point it would be a uniform uniform fee for the, across those two districts. And I already mentioned the, uh, the ELU factors on the previous slide, so I'll just go up ahead. Uh, one other uh, major items that was a discussion point uh, was with respect to uh, impact fee uh, credits and their um, expiration. Um, I believe the, 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 uh, the direction of the, the commission was that the, the supporting of the elimination of the impact fee expiration and the decision point here would be um, with respect to um, should it occur now or should it occur uh, in the fall. So I'm going to go a little quick, so feel free again to, to, to stop me when you like. Um, so the, the next uh, uh, group we'll talk about is the Perks and Recreation fees. Uh, for this one, we have, uh, these are fees that are only um, applied to uh, residential properties. So that would be just single family, multifamily, mobile homes. These aren't charged to non-residential properties generally. I think there's one or two municipal municipalities out there that do it, but it's very rare. Um, and so the existing fees you'll see there, about $1,300, $1,000, about $785 for the respective classes. And what we did was we calculated the maximum supportable fee based on your, your asset data, your capital planning data, and, 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 and investment and everything. And you'll see those maximum supported fees in the center column of $2,500, uh, $2,021, and about seven, just under $1,700. And then uh, they also have a 50% increase uh, shown there as well. That would be a 50% of the differential. Um, that we were showing. Um, and for in terms of uh, major decision points there, one of the things that we had asked for guidance on was whether or not um, you know, I wanted to move forward with going with the maximum supportable fee or some uh, capped amount. I believe the, uh, the commission's direction was that there was uh, general support for going with the maximum uh, fee amount that was uh, justified as a, as a result of the study. That would be that uh, $2,500 uh, for a single family home uh, fee. And um, you'll see here, one of the other things that was uh, requested was a, uh, an analysis of the revenues associated with those fees. So what uh, staff has put together in that tabulation at the bottom of the slide here is uh, if you were to look back at the historical period of time of uh, 2018 to 2022, what the fees, um, what fees have been collected in that window of time based on the existing fee structure and what they would have been under the, the two uh, scenarios being either the, the full fee or some uh, phased in amount and capped amounts there. Uh, for stormwater, um, for this one, uh, it's a, a little different. This one, actually, we, we, um, we recommended that this fee should actually um, be discontinued. And the, the reasons for that is there's some difficulty in establishing some of those um, those requirements that I mentioned on the front end, some of the, the, the links in terms of benefit and the links in terms of capacity and, and whatnot. And so it's it's very rare to actually see a stormwater uh, impact fee. I think I've, aside from, from the city currently, I've only seen one other place that does it. And I think they were actually looking to get rid of theirs as well. Um, what we think would be a better way to, um, to, to fund the needs of the system would actually be um, through the, 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 the user rate there. So uh, moving ahead to local roads and uh, mobility fees. So a bit of a busy tabulation, but what you'll see here are the, uh, the respective uh, land use categories and the current fees uh, for, for each of those and the proposed fees based on the uh, local road impact fee analysis. Um, you'll see that uh, some of them, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big increase. Um, you know, the, the single family going from you know, $162 roughly to about $165. Um, and then some of them are you know, going a little higher. Uh, one thing I would, I would note here is that in terms of these um, differentiated uh, you know, non-residential land uses, um, you, you have some flexibility with the, with, the, with the land uses that you actually apply these fees to. So for instance, uh, as a part of the study, one of the major categories that had a, a pretty big uh, impact was a uh, fast food that you'll see on screen, a uh, proposed fee of about $25,000 per thousand square feet of uh, developed space. Um, 
that can be uh, easily encompassed as a part of the, the restaurant category if, if, if it's the, the, the commission's um, you know, um, desire to do that. Um, so you know, that's a category that doesn't currently exist as a part of the, the, the fee structure and doesn't necessarily have to be carved out as a separate one. It can be um, encompassed in that one, and that way the, the, uh, the fee there would only be around the, the $5,000 range. Uh, the same would hold true for uh, convenience stores. If that's one that um, is felt to be a little strong on the increase, um, or just the, the fee itself, that's something that could also be uh, potentially encompassed in just one of the retail categories, uh, general commercial, uh, for instance. And so you, you do have some flexibility there in terms of uh, how you want to go about structuring things. These would just be some of the, 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 the ones that are uh, part of the initial analysis or some of the, the heavy hitters. Um, for the mobility fees, um, you see it's a pretty big increase there. The existing fee is $16 uh, per person trip, and the proposed fee is $85.67. Uh, um, a little bit of uh, background on that, if I recall correctly, and, and Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, when that $16 fee was initially put into place, the, the initial calculated amount was around the $70 range. Um, but in the interest of trying to uh, not create a big impact on growth and, and development, it was set at that $16 level. So if you to think of the, the $70 to the $85, it's, it's still a big increase, but it's not quite the, the same. Uh, that being said, um, so oh, sorry, uh, some of the, the prior to, uh, decision items um, was should the, the fees be implemented uh, in full, and then um, let's see the, the mobility fee. I'll just skip ahead for this one and jump to the options here. So uh, one of the things that um, we have here is a comparison of the, the local roads fees. You'll see the, the Orange Beach current fees at the top of the, the graphic, uh, the full, uh, fully built opposed fee there as the, the second line, and then some of your neighboring comparables. And then you'll see that um, on the fast food and convenience store side, it's um, what I mentioned before, the, the fully proposed fee of the 25000 or if you would like to uh, include that as a part of restaurants and then a convenience store as a part of retail. Then you can see those um, differences there. On the mobility fee side, um, there's some policy direction that was uh, requested in terms of uh, the appropriate fee level to charge. Um, what you'll see on, on the graphic here would be the, the currently um, uh, proposed fee uh, for the local roads. You'll see the current Ormond Beach uh, mobility fee, and then you'll see the fully uh, proposed fee as option one. And then for options two, three, four, and five is some percentage uh, level of that. Um, and you, know, you do have some flexibility in terms of what fee you adopt. Uh, for instance, if the, the, you know, the maximum supportable fee is $85, you can choose to do something less than that, and that's what this is uh, representing here. Um, what I would be uh, cautious of is just um, if you're looking at, let's say, the roads fees and mobility fees, you can't pick one business and, and be different with it. You have to treat all of them the same. So now you can, you can differentiate between the local roads versus the mobility fees because they are two different fees. They're based on different assumptions, uh, different capital needs, and so on. So those you can, you can choose to phase in at different rates, but you want to make sure that internally, as the fees are applied, you treat everyone uniformly. So uh, moving ahead to uh, police and fire and the feasibility analyses. Uh, this one, the, the initial part of our, our, our scope was to look and see if, if the city can actually provide the required data that is used in support of, a, of an impact fee uh, calculation, um, and also that the department is generally configured in a manner that would support that. And the findings of that um, feasibility analysis were that the city can provide that data and it is configured in a manner that, it, that is uh, applicable, and so we recommended that uh, the city should move forward with that. Um, as a result of that, uh, we were then were tasked with developing those proposed fees for the city, for uh, police and for fire. And I think that's what we'll be jumping into here. Uh, in terms of the, the general methodology for, for this, uh, what we do is we look at the existing investment in police and fire assets. That would be you know, any stations, uh, vehicles, in terms of fire and apparatus, uh, you know, uh, the, the large uh, vehicles, um, equipment, uh, all those things. We look at the existing investment in, in those respective departments. Then in terms of um, you know, on a forward-looking basis, we look at the, the near-term capital plans for those respective departments as well. So what we're trying to do is come up with a bucket of existing costs and then uh, planned future costs that are in support of the existing system, but also in terms of supporting 
economy of growth. So that's to, to get the first part of the calculation is kind of that cost bucket. Uh, from there, we then uh, do some allocation work because those assets are in support of providing service for residential properties and non-residential properties. And so we use um, some different data points to try to come up with those allocation factors. Um, we use uh, the call data for the respective departments, for the police department or the fire department. And we also use uh, an approach uh, called the functional population approach, which I'll get into on, on the next slide. And so in, in doing so, we, we take that cost bucket that I mentioned a moment ago, we break it out, and then from there we allocate it on a per unit basis, um, per unit being for uh, residential development per single family home or, or multifamily unit, and for uh, non-residential on a, either a per, per square foot basis or a room basis, depending on which fee we're talking about and what's the most applicable method for it. So the, the functional population approach that I mentioned just a moment ago, um, it's, it's a in essence, what it's trying to do is, is be equitable among the non-residential land uses. And the idea being, if you have a, a warehousing facility and you have, a, let's say, a, a Walmart or a supermarket of equivalent size, the potential demand for either police or fire service is different between them. And the idea being there's more people going through the supermarket or you know the Walmart or something compared to the warehouse. So what it's trying to, what, what's, uh, what's trying to be achieved is um, distributing people's time uh, uh, across those different facilities in an attempt to create a, a weighting factor between the non-residential uh, land uses. So in order to develop that, land, that, that factor, what we do is we look at uh, trip generation studies that are, are conducted by the Institute of Transportation Engineers, and they, um, they develop uh, what are these trip coefficients that we that we use, and they are you know, trips to and from uh, various non-residential uh, property types. We then take that survey data, and then also some of the demographic data of the city in terms of you know employment, population, uh, things of that nature, and we kind of uh, mix it together, and then with uh, certain assumptions as uh, the, how the different uh, land uses may have um, people's time allocated to them, we come up with these composite weighting factors that then we develop the fees based on, and that's how you'll get those different fees uh, per approach. So really the whole thing boils down to just trying to be as fair as you can to the various property types, understanding that their character is different in terms of you know their business, but also in terms of their impacts and demands for police and fire protection services. Another part of, of that analysis is, is um, involved is uh, a, a population and, and dwelling unit forecast. That goes into that unit part of the calculation I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, to develop these uh, population factor uh, items, we look at Census Bureau data, we look at some other third-party sources such as the Bureau of Economic and Business Research, as well as the Florida Housing Data House Clearinghouse. And, um, those do um, both uh, historical uh, records of population units, occupancy, uh, and also have projections of those numbers going forward. So we look at those items together in conjunction with the city's planning data to try to create a, a realistic, or a reasonable, I'll say, um, um, approximation of what the, the growth is going to be over the, the window of time that we're looking at, which is through uh, 20, uh, 2040. And so uh, the, the average growth rate that you'll see there comes to about, I want to say, just under a percent on average. It's a little front-loaded, and then it kind of tapers off over time, the idea being as you, you fill out even more, it starts to slow. And so these would be the, the, the units we use when we, when we get into that calculation. Uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the police analysis, um, you know, the department uh, provides you know, law enforcement and crime prevention uh, uh, services to the community. Um, there's currently uh, 94 uh, total personnel as part of the, the budget year that we evaluated. Uh, 74 of those uh, are included in the uh, calculation as sworn positions. And the idea is that the level of service that we look at is based on um, sworn positions per thousand of population. And so the, currently the city is providing about 1.66, 1.7 officers per thousand. Um, with a, um, and that's it's about in line with what I see throughout the state. Um, sometimes you'll see around you know two, two and a quarter. It just kind of depends. I have some clients that if you look at their um, their population um, versus their um, their number of officers, it can be very different. I have one up in the Panhandle that they have around four officers per thousand. But the reason for that is they have quite a seasonal population when it comes to spring break and summer break, where they have a lot of visiting um, you know um, uh, travelers. And so you know, from from what we what we see here, the the one point seven is is what the city's providing that. You know, works for, for your community right now. Um, looking at the, the existing investment in the department, there's about seven and a quarter million dollars in terms of total investment. That's stations, the fleet, that's probably the biggest part of the investment, and then um, equipment. 
um, you know, one of the, the, the things we look at, like I said, we, we have those um, those buckets that we were talking about a minute ago. Um, with respect to uh, the revisions to the impact fee statute that took place in 2021, we can no longer include equipment as a part of the calculation. So we account for it in terms of our analysis, but then we exclude those items. Those are short-lived assets that um, that the state now says you, you can't include, but you used to be able to. Um, so of that uh, seven and a quarter million, um, we've included uh, the vehicles and facility-related assets. Uh, we then looked at the future items, like I mentioned before, the capital plan, and that's about $3.2 million of planned future investment in the department. When we look at that, we then carve out from that um, anything that's replacement of existing um, assets because uh, the impact fee is designed to recover the cost associated with growth, not the replacement of existing items. And so when we net out some of those replacement related projects and anything that may have been either grant funded or contributed, in this case there's no grant funding associated with the plan, um, only about uh, just over a, a quarter million as included from that capital plan. So when we net that all together, it's about just under $7 million of, of existing and planned future investment uh, in the police department. And that's what's uh, included in the fee calculation. Uh, it's a very busy graphic up here, up here to essentially say what I said previously. We take the costs, break them out, get the units, divide them up by the units, and we get to here. So you have the proposed single family fee, applied per dwelling unit, $240, multifamily, $198, uh, mobile home, $166 per dwelling unit. And then for the non-residential land use types, what we honed in on was uh, just a handful of them. Um, so uh, industrial and warehousing, institutional, hotel, motel, office building, and retail. Those are some kind of the, the major um, ones that we have. I do have some clients that um, try to take it a little, like they, they, they go a different approach with it. And I have one that I'm currently working with that they have 80 different uh, categories. I'll tell you that's administratively burdensome because um, then they have to track all those specific land uses by type and everything. So where, uh, where things are going in terms of the industry and the, and the changes to uh, the statutes in terms of defensibility and, and everything is trying to, uh, I think there'll be expression that, that I was told was, I'd rather be um, generally right than specifically wrong. And so what we're trying to do is make sure everything is defensible as possible. And you have some, um, your discretion is uh, you know, who fits in what, uh, what class. In terms of uh, overall comparability, uh, the proposed fees put you just a little below the average of a uh, uh, good uh, grouping of your neighbors. Uh, the average was uh, $268 per single family dwelling unit for the surveyed municipalities that actually charged fees. Uh, we did look at some others, but some don't charge it, so this would just be the ones that actually do. And then moving to fire. Um, same general approach, we look at level of service um, for, for the department. Um, there's a, a target response time, whereas before we were looking at staffing per thousand of population, fire is more in terms of uh, response times. And then uh, also uh, wanted to make mention that the ISO rating is uh, three, three X. Uh, that has to do mainly with um, you know, uh, distance from hydrants, uh, apparatus, water pressure, though those insurance ratings take into account uh, a lot of different items. Um, and then want to say the lower you are on the scale, the, the better your actual uh, score is. Um, currently there's uh, 48 uh, personnel um, and the, uh, the response calls are roughly allocated about 61% uh, residential, 39% uh, non-residential. Again, that's, I see that in most municipalities, it's a pretty common uh, distribution. Usually it's 60-40, 70-30. In terms of total investment in the department, is about $9 million currently. Uh, that's spread among equipment, uh, vehicles, and uh, stations, and uh, major equipment in support of those stations. Um, when we look at the, the planned future investment, it's about one and a quarter million dollars uh, over the period of time that we were looking at, um, which includes um, you know, new apparatus, generators, station alerting systems, and others. Um, of that $1.7 million, about uh, just under 0.7 million is what we're, what we're including in the fee. Again, for the reasons I mentioned before, we can't include those renewal and replacement items. We can include the, the new uh, capacity, new growth related items. Um, so in terms of total uh, dollars recognized as a part of the fee calculations, uh, it comes to about $9 million in existing and planned future uh, investment in the department. Um, again, same graphic, same method. I'll skip right over here. 
So in terms of proposed fire and pet fees, uh, single family comes in at $292, multifamily $262, uh, mobile home $240, and then the respective uh, non-residential land uses are, are the same ones that we saw a moment ago in police, with the, the various fees being applied either on a per square foot or, or per room basis, depending on the nature of the, the, the land use. And uh, I'll go back one second. One other thing about this approach with, with the functional population approach real quick is that to the degree that you, you have, let's say, a, a new developer, a new property or something coming in that says, well, you know, maybe my trip generation is different than that, then what this method allows you to do is they can um, you know, do their own trip generation study, plug it into the formula and the method, and you know, see how it turns out. So it gives you a little bit of flexibility there as well as there's a catch-all rate um, just in case someone feels they don't necessarily fit in into one of those uh, prescribed boxes. In terms of overall comparability, um, just a little above the average, so pretty much in line with, with everyone else and your neighbors. Uh, the, the surveyed municipalities we looked at was about $271 per uh, single family dwelling unit, uh, so you know, just in line. So in terms of what we would uh, recommend for uh, police and fire is that um, that uh, the commission would uh, choose to adopt the fees at their full uh, level. Um, we also say that you want to review these fees periodically, uh, making sure, again, just like I mentioned on water and sewer, that it's reflective of your, your growth, if there's any changes in growth, any changes in uh, regulation or anything like that that might impact some of your, your, your cost structure. And then uh, with respect to implementation, one of the things I, I didn't mention in the front end that was a part of those requirements for the fees is that um, from when the fees are made um, effective, you still have to provide 90 days before they're actually charged, and that's to give the building community a chance to make sure they can reflect those changes in their price structure for, for things that are in the queue. Uh, in terms of a uh, general plan going forward, uh, you'll see um, you know, we have some uh, different items going from March all the way through uh, June. That would be with respect to a planning board, uh, the ex extraordinary circumstance uh, meetings associated with uh, the implementation of the Parks and Rec Impact Fee Study, uh, local roads, because those had um, significant increases, um, as well as um, you know, uh, planning board meetings, uh, first and second readings of the respective ordinances, um, with the, the planned effective date of the, the ordinance being in September. So in terms of the, the policy direction, I know I did a lot of talking and a lot of, I'll call it dry material. Um, and to me, it's all interesting. That's why I've been in, in it for you know 13 years now. Um, I liked it. <laughs> um, I didn't even know this business existed when I, when I was in college. But anyway. Um, so uh, one of the first times we wanted to, um, to get some policy direction on is with, is with respect to the impact fee credit revisions. Um, could be uh, completed by May, or excuse me. 2003? 2023, <laughs> we're going back in time. <laughs> Sorry about the typo there. Um, then um, also uh, seeking direction, um, verification of the desired parks and rec recreation impact fee is the maximum amount, and whether or not it should be implemented in one or two um, phasings. Uh, should the local roads fee um, include drive through restaurants and put it in the restaurant category? Um, should the local road fee include convenience stores as a part of the retail category or keep them separate? Um, and then uh, what mobility fee should be charged? Again, we talked about those. You, know, you have some flexibility in terms of what level you want to adopt it at and then uh, potentially either phase it in over time. And, uh, and then um, any comments on um, the actual police and fire analysis that you may have. So uh, if there's any questions on any of the material, I'm glad to go back and forth uh, through any of them. Thank the, uh, you. Any questions? Mr. Mayor? Commission Deputy Mayor Bryler. Just two quick ones um, yes, to start with. I guess one question is why, why such a drastic increase in some of these fees? And I guess my guess is because it's been so long since reviewed, we have reviewed these fees. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that is a big part to play. Since they've been adjusted. Yes. Okay. Yes, the yeah, investment we've made in that window of time has increased. Okay. And the, and the impact fee, you'd like the utility impact fee for redevelopment, and I'm just going to use just an example. Say you had a 200-unit hotel and the hotel was demolished. Whoever built that hotel already paid the impact for that, for that site. Mm -hmm. If someone comes in and redevelops another 200-unit hotel, I don't think that person should 
have to pay the impact on that only because it's almost like the city's getting a second bite of the apple. Correct. Now, if it's a 400 foot, if it's a 400 unit hotel, then you know. If it's, a, I, I would say, if it's a 400 unit hotel, then you get to charge that increment of increase. 200, 200. exactly. So that's probably comment on that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Perkins. Do you know when we when we did the last time the city of Orange Beach increased the impact fees? What year it was? So in, in 2011, the mobility fees were implemented. Uh, prior to that, um, the, the water and sewer had annual CPI adjustments, but the, the roads was like 1996. Wow. So um, and when you look at it versus other jurisdictions, I think what you see is we're, we're in the middle, with the exception of a couple of those that could be rolled into other land use categories. Yeah, so thank you. The, yeah, the faster. Thank you, Stephen. Any other questions? Commissioner Tolman. Yeah, I have a question about the mobility impact fee. What's included in mobility? Is that in, is that like um, active modals, trails, sidewalks included in that? No. What's included in all the mobility total? I believe my understanding is uh, those items that you, you mentioned. Um, we did have a, a transportation uh, subconsultant that was, that's their specialty is, is that um, particular area. Um, but I want to say that it has to do with those other modes that you mentioned. Okay, thank you. I think that's it. Thank you for now. And uh, we've got one card, and then we'll have discussion. If there's any other questions, we can take them at that time. But I have a card from Paul Holub. Mr. Mayor, members of the commission, uh, my name is Paul Holub. I preside at uh, 675 North Beach Street. Um, I think by the attendance here tonight, you probably don't have a lot of opposition to impact fees. However, I would just like to bring to your attention a couple uh, items within your proposal, piggyback to what the county charges. A uh, quick service restaurant, similar to a Culver's uh, in size, um, between the city impact fees, if you don't group those type of restaurants all under the restaurant category, between the county and the city, the local road mobility would be $315,000 for impact fees, not counting water, sewer, or any of your others. That's just local roads, mobility. Um, the county does have uh, a me mechanism where you can pay under protest and then uh, identify your actual trips. Um, we did the first uh, payment under protest in 1994 with Blockbuster Video Center uh, with the county, and we paid in $96,000. They had a refund of $65,000. And so some of the reason for that is they use the ITE manual, and for certain categories, it doesn't pan out. It's, it's very, uh, it's just not accurate. The only quick service restaurant, probably in Volusia County, that actually meets the threshold of the number of trips is probably a Chick-fil-A. They do nine, 10, 11 million dollars a year on the average, some of the average stores. But for instance, when we did the Culver's in Port Orange, the county agreed to reduce the impact fee. Uh, because we were able to demonstrate with other Culver's the number of trips by their sales tickets, by their sales tax um, reports and their actual number of sales tickets, they would have gladly paid the higher impact fees, but what the town was charging was 2,100 trips a day. Their average ticket's 11 or 12 dollars. That store would have been doing eight and a half million dollars. It just doesn't do that. It's you know it's a three million dollar. The average Culver's is probably a three million dollar store in annual sales. So I just hope that the city at least has a mechanism where, on some of these categories where they are very uh, inaccurate to the actual. Uh, uh, operation that you can pay under protest and come back and demonstrate what your actual trip impact uh, are. And again, hopefully the, the staff and the consultant can get together and come up with some uh, ways to do that, sort of a full-fledged traffic study, uh, allow tra uh, a traffic engineer to count trips for a seven-day period, that type of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Paul and Stephen, that'll be the first question as we uh, get ready to go into discussion. Do we have a mechanism included for that? 
So the, the draft ordinance, the, the staff has drafted so far, has an alternative analysis. So if you believe that, that you have a trip, different trip generation, you can do that analysis with a traffic engineer, submit it to staff. Staff will either accept it. If we accept it, we move forward. If we don't accept it, they could appeal it to the commission. The commission would have a final review. With the mobility fees, they're based on ITE trip generations. So typically those are from the traffic engineer to start. So the mobility fees should be very accurate, includes passerbys. So I think the mobility fees will, will be the most accurate. The local roads are based on, on general categories, and that alternative analysis would be available in the new ordinance. Okay. And so if it's a Chick-fil-A on State Road 40, and we charge the maximum $25,000 $25, fee, do they have to pay it? So, so that's one of the policy questions tonight, is if you want to charge a separate land use category, if you want to roll it into the restaurant category, staff is fine either way. So if there's a decision that you want to charge the full you know, fast food, then, then everyone, every fast food restaurant pays it. They would have the ability to do the alternative analysis a Zaxby, for, for instance, is different than a Chick-fil-A. So they would have the ability to go through that analysis. You can't single out Chick-fil-A, is what you're saying. Correct. Or, or, or Dunkin' Donuts. And, and ITE, to its credit, has, has created more categories to try to, to hone into those different uses. So, you know, they're evolving, too, as they go from addition to addition. Right. And... I don't know. I mean, it doesn't seem fair to charge Chick-fil-A 25000 or any fast food restaurant that's on a state road or a county road when those dollars that we're collecting can only be used on city roads that may not be anywhere near where that restaurant is. How do you account for that or make that fair? Because they have those trips have impacts on local roads. So, you know, they're, they're using these local roads, whether it be Division, well met, those, are, those roads have trip generation starting points. So, you know, there's a lot of traffic engineering, which I don't really understand, that, that takes the link from your house, because your house isn't generally on a state road, to that county road, to the state road, to your endpoint, and then back to your house. Interesting. Uh, Deputy Mayor Barley. Mr. Mayor, I guess to to Stephen's point, maybe to Mr. Hollow's point, um, and I'm just going to use two different uses, a Zaxby's versus a Chick-fil-A. And let's just even say, for instance, the restaurants are the same size, they're the same category, they're both fast food restaurants. They'll both pay the same impact fee, but the Zaxby's may not generate, probably doesn't generate the same amount of trips as the Chick-fil-A. So would there be a mechanism, I think what Mr. Hollum is saying, is there a mechanism on that Zaxby's you can come back and say, look, we're not producing this type of traffic that was anticipated. Is there any sort of, you know, refund? Correct. And, and, and depending, so a mobility fee would be your actual ship generation prepared by a traffic engineer. So if they're in the mobility quarter, quarters, which Saxby's is, and actually right. Chick-fil-A is too, it's going to be a much more specific, you know, you're, you're already going to do that analysis as part of your, your site plan. If you're outside the mobility fees, yes, there, there's one rate that's going to be applicable. And then if you disagree with that rate, you have an opportunity to generate that study, have it reviewed. If staff concurs, that's what it is. If staff doesn't concur, it comes to the commission. Now, on these studies, of course, you, you, you're going to want a traffic engineering study, obviously some counts. But can you use similar stores? For instance, Burger King doesn't generate the same traffic McDonald's does. Okay. If you have neighboring Burger Kings that, you know, and they're all pretty close together, can you use that trip rate? Right, so there's, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, similar stores would, would be a good way to do it. You could assess the fee, and then once the store is open, you could do trip generations. You know, once the store is open, and then credit or, or, or you know credit it then. So there are a number of different ways you can do it. But I think the important fact for tonight is that there is an alternative analysis which would allow a, a, a user who doesn't feel they meet the typical rate sure. an opportunity to get to, to get relief. Right, because the IT manual it just it just it just basically categorizes 
uses. It doesn't say it's it's a Chick Fil A or McDonald's. Right. I mean, ch- uh, whatever. It just uses a certain use, and that's what generates the trips by. Correct. And that appeal mechanism has a safety valve of coming to the commission as right. the final step. So Correct. Okay. Commissioner first. And then would would you would the person who built the restaurant or the fast food uh, store would they have to pay that first and then get a refund? I sort of. So there was a couple of different ways you do. You, if you're doing actual trips, yes, they would have to pay it and get the refund. You could also, you know, if I, I'm thinking as Axby's, they could go to other Axby stores and get the trip generation from there. So with enough planning, you could do it um, ahead of time. So there's a couple of different ways that it could be done. Thank you. Absolutely. Commissioner Tallman. Is that a costly study for the person building that restaurant or? There, there's, there's a cost to it, there, but they're already, usually if you're, you're a fast food, you're already doing a traffic study based on the trip generation anyway. So any any use that's a more than a thousand trips has to do a traffic study. So that could be rolled into their traffic study. And, and the second point, it's probably less than, depending on what you select as the, the impact fee, it's going to be less than, than the impact fee, right? So they're still going to come out ahead. Gotcha. All right. Uh, thank you, Stephen. I think that's everything for now. Commissioner, I'd like to go through each of the uh, eight discussion points where they're requesting direction. The prior commission addressed each of these, and you've seen the results, but uh, this commission gets to take a fresh look at it. So first of all is the uh, impact fee credits for demolished buildings, uh, either doing that by 10% per year or doing it immediately, as I understand it. Is that right, Stephen? So the, the, com- the commission direction was to eliminate the 10% reduction, right? So you're not going to lose credit over time. So really the question is, we can do our land development code now, have it effective by May 2nd, or we can wait until the entire ordinance is done. There are projects, such as the hotel on South Atlantic, that would benefit from that. So it would allow some projects to probably start a little earlier. Um, so that's why we're, we're asking the question. Right. And my inclination was to do it now, Commission, yes. but I was going to see. I agree. I, would, I, agree. I think yeah. everybody agrees on that one. Right now. Thank you. All right. do you. Do you want us to vote on each of these, Joyce, or is just given direction? I'm just looking for consensus, and I think I saw consensus for yeah. that. Okay. Number two, parks and recreation, should the maximum supportable fee be assessed or cap the increase at 50% of the maximum, uh, considering comparability with neighboring jurisdictions? The city commission was previously was supportive of the maximum supportable fee. In the one time. Right, in the one yeah. time. I definitely agree. Everybody okay with yeah. that? Okay. So no change there. Number three, uh, should the impact fee increase... We just did that one, right? We, we talked about it. Well, so we're looking for direction. So so do you want to have it as a separate land use category for a fast food at the 25000 or do you want to include it in the um, existing restaurant land use category or an existing impact fee ordinance lumps it all together as, as restaurant? Where are you at, Stephen? I'm on number three still, parks and recreation. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you yeah. provided direction on page three of nine. You got what you needed on that? Yes. I thought we might have covered it, but I just wanted to make sure. Okay. So stormwater, uh, is the commission still supportive of eliminating yes. stormwater fee? Yes. So, I think we're on, yeah. yeah. So at the, at the very end of the presentation, there are six questions yeah. on the screen. Yeah. I'm, in your, I'm in your memo. Page three of your okay. direction. So at the very bottom, there's some, some direction that we're seeking at that memo. So which, which page should we be on? Can you get Stephen's page three up there? Is that it? Okay. There it is. These six. Okay, that's page eight of nine, or what's in front of us on page 39 of the reference. I think it was 39, I think. Yeah. So we got consensus on number one. And two. Mm-hmm. And, and two. two. Right. And three. Oh, not three yet. No, we no, we're discussing three, I think. So, Commission, um, <clears throat> I don't think it needs to be 25000 but I don't think it should be as low as it is no. currently. I thought it should be more like 
some comparable jurisdictions, like in the 13 to 15 range? I, I would say the minimum 15. I'd say 15 to 20. That would be what I say. I mean, we want to see the graph again. When you compare it to the other cities. So, so in the category, nothing is ever easy. You can't, um, for, for the land uses, you can't decrease one by 50%. So if you're decreasing the local roads by, or the, um, the factory by 50%, all of them, including single-family, multi-family, retail, they would all have to be decreased by 50%. So really, your, your, your choice is, you know, decrease. Or to group them. Yeah, apply the percentage uni uniformly through it out, or to um, use the restaurant, or to charge the fast food. So basically, I would think you would probably want to lump it together with restaurant. I agree with that. I mean, the only exception really that we all know about is Chick-fil-A. Right. You know, everybody else is pretty much more of a restaurant. And if we get another Chick-fil-A, that could change. <laughs> we'll come back. We won't wait 20 years. <laughs> so that should go to, fast food should go into the restaurant category. So we have a consensus to keep fast food with restaurants. Yes. Okay. And what about uh, convenience stores? Retail? You're talking about convenience, the con the next one. Yep. I I would I, I tend to think that that should be under the general commercial. It, I think it should be a uh, Where is it right now, Stephen? It, it's its own um, category. But I think we could support doing the general commercial um, as retail. At least it's worth a discussion yep. up here. Correct. So today it has its own um, own category. But it is a type of retail that could be lumped under, under the general commercial. And the reasoning I'm thinking is because it's got um, delineations of greater or less than with square footage, and that would, that would make an, a difference. It's just my thought. Can you get back to your original slide so we know what's coming up? Of the different things? six. Yeah, it's on number four. Page 39. Yeah. So right now we're on, on number four. Except for a Bucky's, you're not going to have a 40,000 foot retail Two convenience foot. store. Yeah. So it doesn't really change the convenience store impact fee at all. They get the, the biggest win, I guess. Um, But we're stuck. It's either that or a huge increase. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, and these, as Mr. Acosta said, this is something that should be reviewed, you know, every four or five years. So, you know, as we as we go into this path, and there's there's a, a different direction, you can always amend it at the next time. Um, <coughs> you think she'd be one of the convenience stores? Retail. Oh, okay. retail? But that doesn't change. I mean, it's the same fee. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't... So it doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't adjust. It doesn't adjust at all. Oh. Is there any way to adjust that, Stephen, to make it more fair in the whole scheme of things? Or why do they get picked as the big winner out of the entire uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven categories? That's the closest land use category we have. So, you know, again, the, the, the choices are decrease the entire um, grouping by a percentage, use the, the, the maximum amount, or to lump it into another uh, land use category. Hmm. And we can go back and see if there's another land use category that would be, you know, more appropriate, but right now the, the general retail, you know, commercial is the most similar. Yeah, that's pretty All right. So, commission will leave that in the retail category at this time. Um, what mobility fee per person? So, so this this chart shows um, different options, and when the mobility fee was was created, there was a policy decision to reduce that fee to encourage redevelopment in the. Um, concurrency exception areas. So if you look at <clears throat> option two, the 69%, it's fairly close to where the proposed uh, local road fee is going to be. 
because you're doing um, passerby trips and, and, and other items, there's no way to get them exact. So 69% would be, I would say, as even as you can get it, 50%, you know, again, just a little, little less, and it really becomes a policy decision of how you want to treat the concurrency exception areas of, of what percentage um, is applied. So you're essentially asking if it should be one of those five proposals. Mm -hmm. Option I one, two, say, three, four, five. I say option one. I'm thinking option one if we're going to, yeah, option one. Is that the consensus of the commission? It sounds like that is. Deputy Mayor Barley, did you have a different thought? Or? No. My only other thought was option two, but I can go with option one. And then any comments or concerns on the new analysis presented for uh, police and fire impact fee? All right. I think you got what you need. Thank you so much. Can I just recap before Stephen goes? Sure. So impact fee credits would uh, start now. We'd make those changes. May. The maximum supportable fee for parks and rec is, was a consensus to do that. Um, should impact fees increase um, separate land use categories for 25000 or lump it, you all decided to lump it with restaurants. Uh, should local road impact fee schedule uh, separate con convenience stores, and you said amend and stay in retail. Lump right? it in retail. And a mobility fee uh, decision point option one. And then the last one, you had no issues with the impact fees for police and fire. And so staff will bring back um, an ordinance that helps adopt that over this schedule in the future. You got public meetings you have to have and whatnot. Correct. And, and if the commission decides they want to do something else on the ordinance, we can amend it at that time. So, so nothing in here tonight is binding. Uh, but it does help us try to prepare the best ordinance we can. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. All right. We're on to reports, suggestions, and requests. And tonight we start, as always, with City Manager Joy Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, thank you very much for your work on that. I know this has been a long process, but um, it's been a good one, and you've made some great decisions, so we're thankful for that. Um, right now, we don't have any budget work. We don't have any workshops scheduled until the budget, but that could change, so don't count your chickens before they're hatched. Um, this Friday at 3 p.m., the police um, department will re retire K-9 Rex and recognize his human handler, Officer Keaton Labrie, and uh, K-9 Rex is not ill or anything. He's just getting older. Um, I do want to, if you could bring up that slide for me, um, presentation, Taylor. Um, Police station. Yes. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the police unity tour. Um, the unity tour, uh, they ride for those who have died, uh, will begin on May 8th and May 14th from Portsmouth, Virginia to Washington, D.C. Um, the uh, Police Unity Tour is a nonprofit organization that brings awareness to law enforcement officers who have died in the line of duty, and it supports the um, National Enforcement Officers Memorial Museum, and it honors the 26,000 men and women who have made the greatest sacrifice uh, in serving their communities. Um, officers volunteer each year to fundraise and ride in the three-day, 250-mile bike trip, and I'm um, very proud proud to say that this coming year, the Ormond Beach Police Department is, is honored to be represented by Corporal Rhett Summerlot, Officer Raphael Medina, and Chief Jesse Godfrey. Is this your sixth time? Tenth, oh good lord. Um, so we just wanted to remind you of that. Um, several of you attended that ride in um, D.C. It's really quite spectacular to see them coming in, and, and it's quite an, uh, quite an effort to ride those hills of Virginia up to Washington, D.C. I used to live in that area, so I can attest to that. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware of that, that um, we're so proud of our, our law enforcement officers, and they, they fundraise for a cause. They have to, um, I think, 
raise $2,500 a piece to participate in that. And um, so we're very proud of your department chief and what you're doing for remembering those that have fallen um, in the line of duty. So I wanted to tell you all about that. Um, could you tell us the dates? I think I missed it. Um, it is May 8th through May 14th. They'll be uh, arriving in D.C. on May 14th. One other question. Do sometimes people gather to, sh to send them off rather than be at the end? I, I think they um, they actually drive themselves up to Virginia to start. So I don't know if you have people there that recognize your starting point, Chief. Yeah, in Virginia. But we, we have not done that in the past. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, uh, again, we're very proud of the department for doing that. Leisure Services this past weekend, we had a huge success of uh, Real in the Fun, and I think um, Commissioner Tom's uh, granddaughter may have oh, yeah. <laughs> participated in that one, and I think Commissioner Sargent what, what, had his uh, sons participate. What? It's just such a wonderful tournament. It was such a great day. So, um, Movies on the Halifax this uh, Friday, March 3rd is... Um, Guardians of the Galaxy. We have Art in the Park, May 6th through 7th. Uh, Ormond Main Street, uh, Taste of Ormond is March 5th. Uh, and the Celtic Festival is April 15th through the 16th. And Stephen will be my guest walking with the manager on Friday. Um, so we, we, we like to do that and get out to the public and, and um, see what's going on. And, and lastly, I just want to say that um, you know, the fire department gave Ethan a memorable send-off. Um, I'm very proud of the men and women in the Ormond Beach Fire Department and how they recognized their fallen comrade and how they uh, joined to support his family, and they continue to be in our thoughts and prayers. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the city manager? Assistant City Manager Claire Whitley. Thank you. City Attorney Randy Hayes. Thank you. All right. Tonight we start with Commissioner Persis. Oh, good. <laughs> good evening, everyone. So glad to see you all still here tonight. Um, I wanted to uh, tell you a couple of things that I've de been doing. Uh, today, um, along with Deputy Mayor Briley, we attended the Seabreeze High School Ribbon Cutting for their architectural program, sorry, agricultural program. And in, in this in the area at Seabreeze High School, students learn to raise pigs, goats, chickens, roosters. They grow vegetables and herbs. Um, they have fi a fish tank, and they're looking forward to expanding their aquatic program and even start raising lobsters. It's pretty incredible what the teacher at Seabreeze High School has done, and the kids that are involved in it um, are just so into it. And they each stood by an area and were able to tell us everything they were doing. It was really incredible, and it, I just wanted every, everyone to know what was going on in Seabreeze because it's such a great school. Um, and along with everybody on the commission, which I love that we all attend everything. It's so great. Um, I was happy to attend the Riverbend Natural Park uh, ribbon cutting just to see that area preserved is you know for for you know forever is is wonderful it's beautiful we saw kids riding bikes people taking walks um, riding on the bike trail it was just it was just a, an amazing day and lastly what I'd like to well not lastly but I'd like to thank um, Kelly Kelly. What a great job you did on the financial report for this fiscal year. You always do a great job, and we're so proud of, of how you work so hard for the city. You and Dan, right? Chris. 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 You and Chris. So please tell him I said so. Um, and then lastly, um, I want to thank Joyce Shanahan and Chief Godfrey for looking into the anti-Semitic flyers, which unfortunately were distributed to residents in Ormond Beach, Daytona, and Port Orange on Sunday. Um, people behind this are cowardly and cruel, and I am pleased to learn that Representative Tom Leak is working with police chiefs to see if there is a constitutional solution. And with that, I'll say good night. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Briley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was uh, pleased to attend, uh, as, as uh, one of my guests, one of my first duties as Deputy Mayor, the Orange Chamber of Commerce uh, Economic Prosperity Hour uh, last Wednesday. 
and uh, we discussed the, the upcoming ribbon cutting that afternoon for the Pendleton property, uh, the moving forward, the moving Florida forward initiative by Governor DeSantis discussing our U.S. 195 uh, interchange, uh, and as well as some of the city's legislative priorities for this year. I want to thank Brian Rademacher for his help with uh, getting us those talking points. Uh, that afternoon, obviously, as, as Commissioner Persis said, we attended the uh, the, uh, the 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 ribbon cutting of the Pendleton the property. Actually, we were next door at Riverbend Park, but that's a great what a, what, a, what a way to team up with the county. What a great use of Volusia Forever funds uh, to preserve 19 acres along the Tomoka River. I think that's absolutely positive. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no downside of that, and we'll get to expand that Riverbend Park. Uh, and as Commissioner Purse has also said, this morning I attended uh, the Seabrook High School facility for their, their uh, agricultural department. And uh, we took a tour of their new greenhouse for the growing kale, lettuce, and tomatoes, uh, saw their compost beds. Uh, we got to see the cows and pigs and goats, chickens and rabbits. A really neat experience when you think you're just right across the street from the beach. So <laughs> it's, it's a little bit different. As alumni, uh, Principal Harris asked me if I'd like to take a tour of the media center, and I did. And uh, as we entered, there was a, a large group of students who were getting ready to take a test. And uh, just to tell you about Tucker Harris, he spoke to the group. He gave them a great pep talk. They went up to every student personally and gave them a fist pump and a pat on the back to give them encouragement. So I really marveled at the way that, you know, his interaction with the students, not only in that media center, but in the halls, making sure they were okay and giving them positive encouragement. Uh, I think Seawrees High School is blessed to have Tucker Harris as their principal. Um, lastly, I will touch on it. Um, I want to thank Dr. Lynch for coming this evening and bringing up the issue of the John Harrison sidewalk. Um, I do think, you know, we look at the we look at the safety of the motor public, but we also have to keep in mind the safety of our pedestrians in Long Beach. And he is, you know, I think absolutely right. John Anderson is a narrow road. We do have a lot of bicyclists that, that use the street, um, pedestrians, and we may want to take another look at uh, the possibility of a sidewalk for John Anderson. With that, I'll say good night. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tolland. Well, I figured I had double time since I missed last time. So I will go as quick as I can. Um, I do want to thank you guys, though, for being so gracious regarding my absence um, last meeting due to the birth of a new grandchild. Um, and I appreciated the, the comments, the support, and the understanding. Um, and thank you, Susan, for um, following up with the anti-Semitic um, propaganda that was passed out that, that truly is unacceptable at any time and it's just heartbreaking that our society um, people are doing that in this world um, so I'll, I'll list a few things and then I have a couple questions for you mayor at the end um, I enjoyed that ribbon cut I enjoyed a ribbon cutting at the YMCA it's a beautiful shade structure and um, it's just it gives kudos to that public private partnership and some echo funding and I think that's just always a way to go to improve your city when you have um, public and private partnerships working together. Um, I was proud to see the extraordinary high schoolers accept nominations and acceptances to the various military academies nationwide. It was heartwarming to see their future taking shape. Um, also, that, that ribbon cutting at Penland property, that was actually, was amazing. Um, and, and if you remember, it was a priority for all our residents um, to have more open space. So this collaboration between the city, the county, St. John's Water Management, ECHO, FDOC, and, the, and, and made all the citizens of Ormond Beach a winner on that. Um, I did have a unique opportunity that you all did not have to judge a talent show at Bear Creek. And I will say it was, a, it was quite fun, quite enjoyable. There were eight contestants. And the winner of our Bear Creek won $250. And she is moving on to um, Ocala for, competition, for a bigger competition. And it's sponsored by the new company that owns Bear Creek called Cove Corporation and it's occurring on all the property. So it was just kind of a fun night for everybody. Um, and yes, thank you. My four-year-old granddaughter caught the first fish 
and at the Ike Leary's fishing tournament sponsored by um, Fish Florida. And um, they, so they weigh your fish in plastic bags right and so she caught this fish I mean she threw it in and she was totally not interested in it because you had to put a worm on the hook she threw the fish in she pulled it up and oh gosh what was his name oh Robert what was his name Caden Aiden amazing young guy, young guy comes over and he runs over all excited takes the little fish throws it in the bag and puts it on the thing that you weigh and he goes it's zero ounces now we'll make it one <laughs> so it's a little one ounce fish and she got the biggest trophy and fishing rods and it was a lot of fun um, and this so thank you thank you for leisure services and, and Ike and Fish Florida for sponsoring that and Ike was out there cooking hot dogs as well so it was just it was it was a cold morning the fish really weren't biting but it was a lot of fun um, Kelly you're amazing you're like my rock star now I'm gonna have to do like a whole tutorial on, on finances with you and everything thank you for all the good work you do it really gives me a great level of confidence um, that you do such a, a, a wonderful job um, update for Main Street I did go to their meeting recently. I'm happy to report that our downtown Main Street received an A-plus report and is now enjoying an accreditation from the National Main Street Organization. Um, they're working on the banding of the sidewalks. Pre-construction mode starts. Um, the, um, is, they're in the pre-construction mode now. They're going to hopefully start towards the end of March. And they're calculating to be about a nine month construction period. And it, it seems like they're, they're very good with um, communicating with all the um, owners on Main Street so they understand what, how that's going to affect them during the construction mode. Um, they did verbalize that they would like to collaborate on bridge lighting if we move towards that direction. Um, they also brought up the fact that there is a piece of legislation now called the Florida State Historic Tax Credit, which will help historic places um, with their restoration of their buildings. So that can be added to the other um, funding that some of the historic places have. I, I'm losing my words. Um, they had a wonderful Granada Grand Festival. It was a very successful art festival behind on um, New Britain. Uh, they are hoping to expand the farmer's market in hours. Um, they right now, currently go on Thursdays during the day. They'd like to extend it a little bit after work hours. That seems to be the trend now. So I think they're, they're working with staff with that. Um, Celtic Festival is April 15th and 16th and the Taste of Wyman is almost sold out um, and that's March 5th. Okay, you still okay with me? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I wanted to just bring up a couple ideas um, and if the commissioners think it's a good idea maybe we can ask a couple, you know, uh, I'd like to get some of your thoughts. Um, at the very first meeting, I offered the idea of a rotating deputy commissioner as a, on a yearly basis. And I know this requires a lot of legal changes. Randy, you know, we can, we'll, we can deal with, with all of that. But if you guys think that that's a good idea, um, then I think that we need to start initiating that and getting that in place because that's not something that I think would happen like right away. So that would be something if anybody wants to, um, Mayor, you can ask the question afterwards. I'm done. Um, I do want to just bring up the point that ECHO funding, I know we know about it, I know we use it, but we can use this resource. How can we use this resource even better? I, sp I was speaking with um, Brad Burbaugh, who's the director of ECHO, and um, 
I know we've enjoyed a lot of partnerships um, with Volusia County through this program, um, but there's a lot more opportunities I think we can we can work on. And according to Brad, we have you know there's a, a, a lot of money in and not enough applications. And he says if we don't use it, um, the, the, we're going to lose that money and that that those amounts. So I don't know if we want to you know have a workshop on. Um, you know, we had that workshop on our strategic plan. You know, maybe now is the time to kind of activate some of those opportunities um, once we get those priorities set. Um, the other thing I'd like to bring up is um, would Orman like to consider supporting that no pay for Volusia residents to, to play on the beach or park as suggested by Councilman Kent at the previous commission meeting? That's just a question. Um, I know he's going to um, present that at Volusia County. It might have even been tonight. I'm not sure. Um, but if that's something that we agree with, then maybe we should offer a letter of endorsement as well for that. Um, and this is, I'm just throwing all this stuff out and then we can bring it all back later, but this is my time. I'd like to also discuss the value of maybe increasing the percentage of native plants used in public places, increasing them in the public design. It's smart for water conservation, promotion of pollinators, and creating healthy habitats for animals, and it's way more sustainable. Last, well, two more things. How can, the other, the other thought is we had a, um, we had Alan Burton come in front of us a couple months ago. He was talking about growing the loop. And it's, it's different than saving the loop. It's, it's growing the loop. And I'm not asking for answers, but right today I'm just planting a seed. <laughs> this concept was presented by Alan. Um, and what, what might work well is to get a group of like-minded folks uh, to kind of brainstorm how we can grow the loop, maybe through a tree canopy program. And that would be on... Um, Beach Street and A1A or John Anderson, if we want to um, pursue the sidewalk idea, with, uh, as suggested by Dr. Lentz, which I think we need to, I know this has a big history. Um, I was not involved with the city when that discussion came up before. I'd like to understand where, where that sidewalk discussion was before, what were the obstacles, and um, what we can do now. So I think I've said enough. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And Commissioner Sargent. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> I had two, two sessions. Well, I echo what everyone else has said with all the events that we've attended. Um, the fishing tournament, thank you to Leisure, Leisure Services and Ike Leary for the wonderful hot dogs. There was a, a seven-year-old that was right by us that caught a three-pound bass. It was huge. Um, it was great to see him and how excited he was. Unfortunately, all we caught was memories. Um, <laughs> Just as important. Uh, yeah. seaweed. Kelly and, <laughs> seaweed. Got yeah, seaweed. I got some seaweed. <laughs> Kelly and Chris, the finance department, and Joyce, thank you for all y'all do. It's, it's great. Um, um, year after year, y'all do an outstanding job. Um, thank you, Chief Godfrey, for your swift action on the anti-Semitic material and how quickly you responded to the um, I know several residences and other um, uh, people in the Jewish community, and they were very thankful um, as I spoke to them. Um, let's see what else I have here. Is it possible? No. <laughs> want to get out of here by 10. Um, is it possible to maybe put the link to the fundraiser for the police ride on social media so that people can contribute to it? I don't know if it's on there. I know Ormond Observer has it on their site, um, but I know that there's still funds to be raised. Um, I, think each, I know. It would be really good, well, nice to have it up there. I think Joking there's like, I think each has raised about $600. I know Chief has raised closer to 12 100, but I'd like to see them all get to that 2,000 mark or more. Um, 
thank you, Dr. Lentz, for coming out and addressing or questioning the sidewalks. I had a, a resident that lives on John Anderson that also called me last week and was curious. You know, several of the residents are so concerned they're putting coquina rocks all along because people are running off the road and, and, and damaging their yards and stuff. So clearly it's an issue um, that I think we need to address. And Pastor, I'll see you sa Sunday at 10. And with that, good night. Thank you, Commissioner and Joyce. Uh, I think, did the John Anderson thing happen just before you got here? You were here for that. I know Commissioner Stowers was here as well. He worked extremely hard on that issue. I mean, to the point of going to every single house and counting votes. Uh, can you send everybody the proposals that came out of all those discussions and hours of work on that? And then I would urge the commission to call uh, former Commissioner Stowers and talk to him about the challenges and what maybe could come from that. Uh, and then if we need to, we can address it address it again in the future. But I know, I can't remember how many hours James spent on that, but I know it was a huge amount of time. Yep, he had a spreadsheet. We had 200 people packed commission. Um, and so, you know, now may be the time to readdress it. As far as the uh, Waste Pro item that was on the consent agenda tonight, I wanted to just say that Waste Pro has been an extremely valuable partner to our city, and we're pleased that we're extending our agreement with them, contract with them for another six years. Um, that contract extension will ensure that Ormond Beach residents and businesses will continue to receive reliable and high quality solid waste services well into the future at levels that our residents have come to expect. And uh, our drivers, our waste per drivers, they love Ormond Beach, and our Ormond Beach residents, they love their drivers, and that's great to see. Uh, we've worked extremely closely with them. They provide a high level of service, and uh, I think we're lucky to, to remain with them for the foreseeable future. Had the opportunity, I think somebody mentioned it, the Homeless Gala, uh, attend that. It was fantastic, and it just made, made you feel great about our community. The fact that after I don't know if it was 13 or 15 years of hard work that has finally come to fruition. And listening to the stories of the individuals who have gone to that shelter and are now are in permanent housing, just uh, incredible, uh, blows you away and makes you realize how worth it it is. Uh, so I'm proud that Ormond Beach is a, a partner in that. I can't remember if it was 13 years ago, Joyce, or maybe 15 years ago, when the Volusia League of Cities was taking a trip over to Clearwater to see how they ran their shelter. Mary Swiderski uh, was the executive director at that time, and she pushed hard to make that happen. She's passed just a year or two ago during the pandemic, but she would have been so thrilled to see the results on uh, on that homeless gala and and just how wonderful uh, the success that they've had. I think they raised maybe a quarter million dollars or $239,000, something like that. But uh, we've put a lot of hard work into that for a lot of years. For the first six or seven years, we weren't sure anything was going to happen. Uh, but it finally did take off. Commissioner Selby put a lot of work into it, and uh, we're still involved. So it's great to see. And uh, nice to see that working together, 16 uh, cities and the county can make something positive happen for our residents. Uh, just a note on Black History Month. There's an article in today's Observer uh, where Belinda Davis, who is the great-granddaughter of Mabel Rose Baker, the daughter of two of Ormond Beach's earliest black settlers. It's a fantastic article highlighting black history in Ormond Beach, and Jarlene did a wonderful job with it. There's some incredible pictures, and uh, there's even a, a paragraph in there on why preserving black history matters. And so I was very pleased to see that and uh, wanted to point that out. I think that's everything I had. So with that, at uh, 8.53, we are adjourned.